Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege once again to come to this place and uh, study your word. And as we study about the keys to the mystery of life and death, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We know that this is a very important subject in this day and age. So we ask that you will give us understanding and that you will give us hope. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the greatest questions, one of the greatest existential questions that have be ever been asked is the question that Job asked many, many millennia ago. If a man die, shall he live again? In our study today, we're going to discuss the mysteries of life and death. And basically what we're going to do is study this subject in 10 specific points. And I want to tell you where we're going as we begin so that when we get there we know that we have covered all of the ground. The first point that we want to study is what is life? Then after we've determined what life is, we want to go and ask the question, what is the body of man? What is the body of man? And that might be self-explanatory, but we're going to examine what the Bible has to say about the body. In the third place, we want to examine what the spirit of man is. What is the spirit? In the fourth place, we want to examine what the Bible defines as the soul. What is a soul and what happens when a person dies with the soul? The fifth point that we want to analyze is how could life be perpetuated at the very beginning? Did man have an immortal soul or was there an external source of life that man needed to partake of? The sixth point that we want to study is what is death according to Scripture? The seventh point that we want to deal with is where does man go when he dies? Where do women go when they die? Point number eight, if we die, is there hope of living again? Point number nine, when will death be totally eradicated from the universe. And finally, why is this subject that we are studying so important to understand in this day and age? And so we have our work cut out for us. We have to travel very quickly, but I hope very thoroughly. And we're going to attempt to answer every single one of these questions. Now let's begin by asking, what is life? Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Here we find a description of the creation of man. And notice what we are told by Moses under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says there, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul or a living being as it says in the New King James Version. Now I want you to notice here that when God created Adam he formed him out of the dust of the ground then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. I want you to notice that this text does not tell us that God gave Adam a soul. We are not told that Adam had a soul. We are told that Adam was a soul. The soul was the totality of Adam. The body plus the breath was equal to the soul. The soul was not something that Adam had inside of himself. In his totality he was a soul. The dust plus the breath equaled soul. 
Now we want to go to our second point and that is what is the body composed of who made the body? Notice Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. Uh, by the way, we just noticed that God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. Now we're going to uh, get an additional glimpse of what creation was like. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. Here we find a description of creation. And it says this, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are potter, and all we are the work of your hand. So notice that this verse tells us that we are made out of clay, potter's clay. Now it's interesting to notice that in the story of creation God spoke everything into existence, but when He formed man He took dust, wet dust, clay, and He formed the body of man and then breathed into his nostrils. And so according to this text in Isaiah 64 and verse 8 we are all composed of dust or of clay in our physical nature. That is our body is composed of clay. Now let's talk a little bit about the spirit or the breath that God gave to uh, Adam when he was created. Now there are two words in the Hebrew which are very closely related. One is the Hebrew word neshama, which is the word that is translated breath here, breath of life in Genesis 2 verse 7. But there's another Hebrew word which is basically synonymous to neshama, and it is the word ruach. Uh, the word neshama is always translated in the King James breath, whereas the word ruach is usually translated spirit. But spirit and breath are actually interchangeable. Now I want you to notice Job 33 and verse 4 on the spirit. Job 33 and verse 4. Here you'll see the synonymous nature of the breath and the spirit. It says there in Job 33 and verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me. And then notice the synonymous expression, And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Do you see how those two uh, sentences are parallel? They say the same thing in different words. It's the same thing to say the Spirit of God has made me. By the way, the word there is ruach and the breath of the Almighty has given me life, or gives me life, there it is the word neshama, the very same word that we find in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. So the spirit and the breath are used interchangeably. Now you'll notice that the spirit or the breath is found where? In the nostrils. That's a very important point. Now, uh, in the resource material that you're going to get at the end of the lecture, you'll have additional uh, verses on these points that I'm underlining right now. But it's interesting to notice that in the Old Testament, both Ruach and Neshama, which are translated spirit and breath, are found in the nostrils. The, the, the spirit or the breath, breath is found in the nostrils. Now let me ask you, what do you use your nostrils for? We use our nostrils to breathe. So what is the spirit or what is the breath? The spirit or the breath is the respiration. In other words, the spirit or the breath is the energizing force, the electrical power source that makes the heart pump, the lungs breathe, and the blood to circulate. It's the vital energy that keeps the body functioning. And by the way, the heart pumps and the lungs breathe and the oxygen is carried to all parts of the body through the blood. In other words, the breath of life or the spirit is the energizing force that allows the body to be alive and to function and to move. Now we need to go to our fourth point. We've analyzed three so far. Number one, what is life? Number two, what is the body? And number three, 
what is the spirit or the breath? Now we need to ask the question, what is the soul? And what happens when a person dies with the soul? There's a lot of confusion when it comes to talking about the soul. The problem is that the word soul in the 20th century means something different in the minds of people than it meant back in biblical times, in the Old and in the New Testament. Now, the soul basically in Scripture is the life of the person or is the person, the individual. Now I want you to notice Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4. Here the word soul, which by the way in the Hebrew is nephesh, is translated life. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4. It says here, But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now that word that is translated life here in the New King James is the identical word which is translated soul or being in Genesis 2 and verse 7. In other words, the soul is the life, is the living entity, the individual, the person. The person whose body is functioning because the breath is allowing the body to function. So the word soul is translated many times in the Old Testament life. But the word is also translated soul in the King James Version. And by the way, the New King James changes the word soul to the word person. I want to give you a couple of examples. Go with me to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 5. This is talking about the people that, uh, Mo, that um, Abraham took with him when uh, he went to Haran. And it says there in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 5, Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and now notice, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan, so they came to the land of Canaan. Notice that they took the people whom they had acquired in Haran. Now the King James Version translates that word souls. Uh, Abraham took the souls that he had acquired in Haran. Obviously, those word souls there means what? It means what the New King James says. It means persons. Notice also Genesis chapter 14 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 21 we find these words now the king of Sodom said to Abram give me the persons and take the goods for yourself once again the King James translates that word persons with the word souls in other words the king of Sodom says you keep the souls and uh, you keep the possessions and I'll keep the souls now obviously the word souls here means what? it means persons and so it is translated in the New King James Version. And so the word nephesh, soul, in the Old Testament can mean life, it can mean person. I want to take you now to a text which has been greatly misunderstood. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18. This is when um, Rachel was dying and she was having Benjamin, her child. And uh, it says here in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Now you'll notice that even the, the New King James Version translates here, As it was her soul was departing, for she died. Now, you could very easily translate that word soul with what? Life. As her life was leaving. And that's the way that it should be translated. But many Christians, you know, they put additional words in here. They say, for example, as her immortal soul was departing to heaven. The text does not say that her soul was immortal, neither does it say that it was departing to heaven. It simply says that her life was going out from her and then it explains what that means. It says, for she 
died. So we can't put more in the text than is there. That word can very, be very easily translated life, just like in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4. By the way, the New Testament also has the same phenomenon. Notice uh, in the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 14, Acts chapter 7 and verse 14, that the equivalent Greek word, which by the way is psyche or suche, is translated also uh, souls in the King James, but it is translated persons in the New King James. Once again, Acts chapter 7 and verse 14 has uh, this same idea of referring to souls as persons. It says here, Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, seventy-five people. There the word is suche, which is exactly equivalent in Greek to the Hebrew nephesh. By the way, the King James Version translates seventy-five souls. But it's really seventy-five what? Seventy-five persons. So what is the soul? The soul is the person or the individual, the living entity, if you please. Do you know that the New Testament also translates the word soul with the word life? Notice what we find in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 20. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 20. It's speaking about the time that Herod was seeking the life of Jesus. He was seeking to kill Christ. And it says here in uh, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 20, here uh, we find the angel speaking to Joseph, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. That is the identical word which is translated in other places of the New Testament, soul. So really, the soul is the life. Herod was not seeking some intangible, invisible entity within uh, Jesus. He was seeking for the life of Jesus. He was seeking to kill Jesus, in other words. By the way, do you know that in the New Testament, the word soul and the personal, personal pronoun are used interchangeably? I want to compare two very interesting uh, passages that we find, or, or verses that we find in the New Testament. Go with me to uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. And then we're going to go to Luke chapter 9 and verse 25. Matthew 16 and verse 26. Here Jesus says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now let's notice how Luke expresses this same saying of Christ. Luke chapter 9 and verse 25. Luke 9 verse 25. Jesus says here, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. In Matthew it says, loses his soul. In Luke it says, loses what? Himself. So what is the soul? The soul is me, myself, and I. The soul is the person, the living entity, the life, if you please. By the way, do you know that the words soul and spirit are used approximately 1,650 times in the Bible, in both the Old and New Testaments. And not once in those over 1,650 references is the word immortal linked with the word spirit or the word soul. You would think that if the spirit or the soul were immortal, you would have at least one verse where the word immoral, immortal is linked to the word spirit or the word soul but it simply is not there. So we've examined what life is. We've examined how uh, God made the body, what the body is composed of. It's composed of dust. We've examined what the spirit or the breath is. We've examined what the soul is. The soul is the living entity. Now we need to go to our fifth point. And the fifth point is this. When God created man, did He create him with an immortal soul 
or with an immortal entity which would never allow him to die or was the source of man the source of life of man outside of man well let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9 Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9 here we find that God placed a certain tree in the garden of Eden a special tree actually there were two and in a moment we're going to go to the other one it says there in Genesis 2 and verse 9 the following and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil notice that the tree of life was in the garden of Eden and we know that Adam and Eve had to eat from the tree of life they had to continue eating from the tree of life in order to continue living now my point is this that Adam and Eve did not have immortality residing within themselves they did not have an immortal soul inside their body because their only source of immortality was in continuously partaking from God's tree their only way to perpetuate or prolong their life was by partaking of the tree outside of them the immortality was in the tree not within them you'll notice that God said in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 that if they ate from the tree they would surely die notice Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die now my question is this if man was immortal by nature what God was saying was absolute foolishness and I'm not intending to be sacrilegious if man had an immortal soul then when God says you'll surely die he was lying because if man had an immortal soul he couldn't die by the way go with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 22 to 24 and uh, you'll see that man is not immortal by nature in fact when he sinned he was cast out of the garden he could no longer eat from the tree of life and therefore he lost the possibility of continuing his life notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22 to 24 then the Lord God said behold the man has become like one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever what would happen if man ate from the tree of life he would live forever by the way he had to continue eating from the tree of life it wasn't enough just to eat once it was kind of like a battery charger you say how do you know that well because even when sin is done away with at the end of time the Bible says that we will go from month to month to eat from the tree of life even in eternity in other words it was a continual eating notice verse 23 therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life in other words man was barred from eating from the tree of life and therefore he was no longer going to live forever is this point clear in your mind incidentally if man is by nature immortal then why would Jesus bother to come to die to give us what we already have really this idea of the immortality of the soul makes Jesus unnecessary it makes the death of Christ unnecessary because if I'm immortal if I can't die why would Jesus die to give me that which I already possess so the only way that life could be perpetuated was by partaking of the tree of life when man sinned he was barred from the tree of life and therefore he was doomed to death now let's talk a little bit about our sixth point and that is what is death and what happens to the body and to the spirit or the breath at death and therefore what happens to the soul go with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19 Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19 and uh, we find here the sentence that God is pronouncing upon Adam it says there God speaking to Adam 
in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return notice it doesn't say your body is dust and part of you will return to, to the dust God says you are dust and to dust you will return in other words he was going to be like he was before he was created you can't return to the dust unless you were taken out of the dust and so what happens with the body when a person dies is that the body returns to the dust it disintegrates, it decays and uh, you know that this is true if you open up a grave many years after the person has died uh, the body has decomposed and the individual is, has been reduced to dust and so when a person dies the body returns to the dust now the question is what happens with the spirit or the breath when a person dies well we have several references in scripture that describe this phenomenon notice uh, Acts, actually John chapter 19 and verse 30 John chapter 19 and verse 30 this is referring to the death of Jesus and uh, we're told exactly there what happened to Jesus when he died it says there in verse 30 so when Jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and bowing, bowing his head he gave up his what? he gave up his spirit the King James Version says he gave up the ghost but actually what did Jesus do? well when Jesus said it is finished into your hands I commend my spirit Jesus breathed his last in other words he expired to give up the spirit means to expire it means to breathe your last do you remember that the spirit or the breath is in the nostrils and you use your nostrils to breathe so when Jesus on the cross died he, he expired and he breathed no more his body was no longer functioning because it didn't have breath are you understanding what I'm saying? now we have uh, some other examples of this in the New Testament I'll just mention them in passing we have for example Herod the death of Herod uh, you can find this in Acts chapter 12 and verse 23 it says that Herod died and he gave up the ghost in other words he gave up the spirit he gave up his breath he breathed his last he expired you find this same phenomenon with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 in verse 5 and verse 10 it says there you know that they uh, actually promised that they were going to give God a certain amount and they ended up giving him less and so uh, Ananias dropped dead and uh, then the Bible says that uh, Sapphira uh, told the same lie and the Bible tells us that she also gave up the ghost, she expired and then the people came and they carried away her dead body so once again when a person dies the spirit or the breath leaves the body and returns to God in other words the body doesn't function anymore it doesn't breathe anymore, it's not energized anymore the body returns to the dust and the breath leaves the body so to speak now we need to go to our seventh point the seventh point is this what happens in the interim period between death and when Jesus comes well we need to let the Bible tell us many people think that when you die you either go to heaven your soul goes to heaven or your soul goes to hell if you were wicked or perhaps to, to an intermediary period uh, a place called uh, purgatory or perhaps to limbo there's all kinds of different categories where people supposedly go but what does the Bible have to say about the retaining place where people go when they die notice John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29 John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 and here Jesus is speaking and he says this do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in heaven or in hell will hear his voice is that what it says? no when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth 
those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Where are the dead after their death and before the resurrection? They are in their graves and when Jesus comes the Bible tells us that they come forth. By the way we have the interesting experience of Lazarus. Lazarus of Bethany, a very good friend of Jesus. And uh, Lazarus died and Jesus came to the, to the uh, tomb which was a cave in the rock, hewn in rock. And uh, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus is what? Our friend Lazarus is sleeping. But I'm going to awaken him. Now isn't that interesting? Death is compared with what? Death is compared with sleep. Do you know that over 50 times in the Bible, death is compared to sleep? Now you say, why would death be compared to sleep? Very simple, I believe there are three reasons. Number one, because when we sleep we rest. And when people die, they rest. I've seen people who have suffered intensely during their lives. They've gotten very ill in the last days of their lives. And when they die, they rest. In Revelation 14 verse 13 say that they will rest from their labors. The second reason why I believe that the Bible compares death to sleep or to rest is because in death, like in sleep, you are unconscious about what's happening around you. And the third reason is that as from sleep you awaken, in the same way from death you will awaken. The only difference is that in death you sleep a little longer than you do when you go to bed at night. And so the Bible over 50 times refers to death as sleep. When people are in their graves, in other words, they are sleeping until the moment that Jesus comes to resurrect them from the dead. Now we don't have time to read all of these verses, but I'm going to mention them and the basic content of each. You, ha you will have these texts in your uh, lecture when you go out uh, from uh, the lecture today. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5, 6, and 10. There's one verse there that says, The living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. Now let me ask you, how much is no not anything? Does that mean just a little bit? Uh, you know, just a little bit of memory? Absolutely not. Very clearly Solomon says that the living, they know that they're going to die, but the dead know absolutely nothing. Psalm 6 and verse 5 says that in the grave there is no remembrance of God. There is no thanking God in death. Psalm 115 verse 17 explains that the dead do not praise the Lord, neither do those who go down into silence. Psalm 146 and verse 4 tells us that the plans of people who die perish. In Psalm 104 verses 29 and 30 we're told that individuals who die they return to the dust. In Acts 2 verses 29 and 34 we find that David did not ascend into the heavens. And by the way, some people say, well, because he lived in the Old Testament and you know, he wasn't going to ascend to heaven until Jesus died on the cross and then Jesus would take him from paradise uh, on the final journey to heaven. Well, that's an interesting concept. But do you know that the Apostle Peter is saying this after Jesus died on the cross and after Jesus has ascended to heaven? This is on the day of Pentecost. In other words, on the day of Pentecost, Peter is saying, David has not gone to heaven. In fact, his sepulcher or his grave is here with us today. Now, also in Isaiah 38 and verses 18 and 19, we find very clearly that the dead offer no thanks, they offer no praise, and they cannot hope for God's truth. And so the Bible is very clear that when an individual dies, he or she goes to the grave, is unconscious, asleep, until the moment of the resurrection. And this brings me to the eighth point. And that is, if a person dies, does that person have hope of living again? The answer is yes. 
Do you remember that in Genesis 2 verse 17 we're told that God said to Adam and Eve the day that you eat of the tree you will surely die on the very day that you eat of the tree you will surely die we've studied previously that they didn't die that very day in fact Adam died when he was 930 years old so how do you explain this? well you'll also remember that on that very day according to Genesis 3 and verse 21 there was a death do you remember that actually there were two deaths the deaths of animals probably lambs that were sacrificed that day what was indicated by that sacrifice of the lambs it was actually a prophecy that Jesus was going to come in the future and he was going to die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in other words in this illustration in the Garden of Eden with the death of these two animals probably lambs God was teaching that the lamb was going to take our death he was going to die the death that we deserve so that we could have the life that he deserves and that's the reason why in 1st John chapter 5 and verses 11 and 12 1st John chapter 5 and verses 11 and 12 we find these very meaningful words and they're very categorical incidentally it says there in John 5 verse 11 and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life notice it doesn't say he will give us it says he has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he who has the son will have life is that what it says no it says he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of God does not have life so what is the key in order to have life we must have whom we must have Jesus this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent in other words if we receive Jesus as our Savior we have the guarantee of life now but we've got a problem let me ask you do believers in Christ die? do they die? I know many believers in Christ who have died so you say what do you mean that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior you have eternal life and yet you still die how do we understand this? well the fact is folks that when we receive Jesus Christ his death takes the place of my death and even though I should die physically someday Jesus is going to come to resurrect me because as I received him he has guaranteed that he will give me everlasting life someday physically and empirically in fact let's notice this in the Gospel of John chapter 11 verses 25 and 26 this is the chapter where uh, Christ resurrected Lazarus John chapter 11 and verses 25 and 26 Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall what? he shall live so Jesus says you might die physically yeah you might die in this life but don't worry about it he says because if you receive me you will have in the future life and it says in verse 26 and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this? now when he says you will never die is he talking about never dying physically? no he's talking about never dying how? eternally not being eternally excluded from the privilege of life and so we find very clearly that God gives us right now hope and he gives us everlasting life in Jesus Christ you know we don't have to be scared of death we don't have to be worried about dying we don't have to be uh, bent out of shape over what happens when we give our last breath when we let go of our last breath we don't have to worry about that because if we receive Jesus our life is hidden in him we can take it to the bank 
It's certain that He has written in, by our name in heaven everlasting life. And someday He's going to break the power of death. In fact, let's go to our eighth point, And that is, when will the power of death be broken? Well, some people say that when you die, you go to heaven. If when you die, you go to heaven, why would Jesus even bother to come and give you life when He comes in His second coming? The fact is, the Bible tells us very clearly that we will receive immortality when Jesus comes. We can have the guarantee of eternal life now, but we will receive immortality when Jesus comes. The final touch of immortality. You say, where does the Bible say such a thing? Well, go with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 51 to 53. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 51 to 53. Here the Apostle Paul is dealing specifically with the issue of the resurrection. And uh, he says this, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and now notice this, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Why would we have to put on immortality if we are already immortal? When will we put on immortality? Is it at the moment we die? Or is it at the, mo is it at the moment when Jesus comes with the sound of the trumpet and resurrects the dead and gives them the touch of immortality and the touch of incorruption? Scripture is very clear on this point. Go with me also to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll read verses 15 through 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15. Here the Apostle Paul says this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, the living are not going to go to heaven before whom? Before the dead. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The same trumpet that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now verse 17 is cru crucial. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Question. Who goes to heaven first? Those who are alive when Jesus comes or those who died? What do most Christians teach? They teach that when a person dies, if they were good, they're whisked off to heaven. If they were evil, they're sent to hell. If that's true, why would Jesus even bother to come? Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so, and so I want you to notice here that this text very clearly says that we will be caught up together with those who died and resurrected and taken to heaven to be with the Lord all together. If we're taken to heaven when Jesus comes, we were not taken to heaven when we what? When we died. The Bible is clear on this. Notice John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 3. John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 3. We find here the promise that Jesus made to His disciples and also to us. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, now notice, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Question. 
When will the children of Jesus be where Jesus is? When he what? When he comes again. It's not at the moment when we die that we go to be with the Lord. It's when Jesus what? It's when Jesus comes again. And in the interim, we're simply resting or sleeping. And when Jesus comes, he's going to wake us up out of our sleep. Notice this wonderful verse that we find in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. It's talking about the death of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And I just love the way that, that his death is expressed here in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60 as they're stoning him. Notice what it says there. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he what? He fell asleep. I like that. It doesn't say he died. It says he fell asleep. Let me ask you, what is the next thing that Stephen is going to hear? The next thing he's going to hear is when Jesus comes, Jesus is going to say, Stephen, wake up! Wake up! And Stephen is going, going to awaken from the grave. And by the way, For Stephen, how much time has passed from the moment he died till the moment till Jesus comes? How much time has passed for Stephen? None. Because all during that period he's been what? Unconscious. Now I'm going to say something which I, don't, I want you to understand what I'm saying. There's a certain sense in which when you die, you immediately go to heaven. Now, let me explain what I mean. For Stephen... His last thinking moment were, was when they were stoning him. His next thinking moment is when Jesus calls him. How much time has transpired for Stephen? None. And so he died, and the next thinking moment, he's with the Lord. For him, from his perspective, there is no period between when he died and when Jesus comes. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so you don't have to wait, oh, I'm going to be in a cold tomb for, for who knows how many years until Jesus comes. You're not going to know it. Your next thinking moment is actually when Jesus is coming on the clouds to call you forth from the grave. And by the way, Scripture says that when Jesus comes, He's going to give us a body like the body of Jesus. Notice what we find in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about the resurrected body of Christ. And he's going to say that we're going to receive a body just like his. He says there in verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be, may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Our body will be conformed according to the body of Jesus. Now there's some Christians that say that up there we're not going to have a body, that we're going to be kind of like spirits or ghosts. Let me ask you, when Jesus resurrected, did he have a body? Of course he did. In Luke chapter 24, we find Jesus appearing to the disciples and he says, listen, you think I'm a ghost, but a ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And then he said, they still didn't want to believe, so he says, do you have something to eat? Do ghosts eat? Is what he's saying. Give me something to eat. So they gave him a piece of a fish and they gave him some honey, and he ate in their midst. In other words, we're going to have real bodies, but they are going to be glorified bodies. They will be b bodies not subject to corruption. They will be bodies not subject to death, because they will be immortal. Now we must go to our ninth point. Ninth point is this. When will death come to an end? You know, it won't even come to an end when Jesus comes. Because when Jesus comes a second time, every wicked person on planet earth is going to die. And all of the wicked who have died before that, we're going to study, study this later on when we deal with the millennium, all of those wicked people who have died before Jesus comes will remain dead. So when Jesus comes, the righteous receive the touch of immortality, but the wicked are still dead. Death has not 
totally been eradicated from the universe. So the question is, when will death be no more? According to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, it will happen after the millennium, after the thousand years. When God destroys sin and sinners, He will destroy also second death, and death will be no more. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more what? Praise the Lord, no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So when God makes a new heavens and a new earth, death will be eradicated from the universe. And then God's people will live forever. Let me ask you, how will we live forever? How could Adam and Eve live forever in the Garden of Eden? Do you remember? They had to what? They had to continuously eat from the tree of life. You say, well, it doesn't say in Genesis that they had to continue eating from the tree of life. It gives the impression that they had to eat only once. Well, the fact is, we know that even in eternity, after we receive the touch of immortality and incorruption, we are going to have to eat on a monthly basis from the tree of life. Notice Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. We're told here about a tree that is in the New Jerusalem. It says, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How frequently does the tree of life bear its fruit? Every month. And by the way, in Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, we're told that when Jesus comes after the thousand years, and He cleanses the earth from sin and sinners, and He makes a new heavens and a new earth, we will go to worship before the Lord from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath. Sabbath to Sabbath because that's the day of rest. Month to month because Revelation tells us that there's the tree of life there which produces its fruit every month and we will have to eat from the fruit of the tree of life every month to continue living. That beautiful verse in Revelation 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do His commandments or who keep His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. God will have a people who will enter the holy city and they will continue to eat from the tree of life and thus they will continue to live forever. Now we need to go to our last point. Why is this subject so important? I'm going to give you several reasons. Reason number one, the idea that man has an immortal soul brings glory and honor to man, not to God. I find it interesting that theologians will tell you, oh, you know, um, only God is uh, omnipotent. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipresent. You know, only God is, has the capacity of being present everywhere, or, or knowing everything, or doing everything. And, and, they, and then when you tell them, um, is only God immortal? Oh, no, no, man is immortal too. No. Immortality is just as much an absolute attribute of God as are all of His other attributes. And to say that man is immortal is to bring honor and glory to man. Furthermore, believing that man has an immortal soul makes God a liar. Because God said you will surely die. And if you say that you don't die because you have an immortal soul, then God was lying. And the devil was what? And the devil was right when he said you shall not surely die. In the third place, if man is by nature immortal, why would Jesus have to die to give me what I already possess, what I already have? It makes the death of Jesus unnecessary. Furthermore, if I have an immortal soul inside that's going to leave the body, and that's the important part of my nature, and, and my old body that I have now doesn't make that much difference, why should I even bother to take care of the body that much? I can treat the body any way I want. Maybe that's the reason why many Christians say that you can eat anything and you can drink anything and you can do anything you want with your body. 
it depreciates the importance of caring for the body if you believe that what's important is your immortal soul that's inside furthermore the belief in an immortal soul de-emphasizes the second coming of Jesus after all if you, when you die you go to heaven why should it be so urgent for you to be expecting Jesus to come to get you in fact you know now there's this woman who, who they've taken the feeding tube out of you know and they're trying to fight to keep her alive you know if I were the parents I would say you know let her rest and according to their belief anyway she's going to go straight to heaven she'll be a lot happier in heaven than in a bed in the hospice but of course people are not sure and so they want to cling and they want to hang on to life finally this subject is very important because those who believe that the soul of man is immortal open the doors wide to spiritualism, to the manifestation of spiritualism. You say if you believe that man is by nature immortal what is to keep people who have supposedly gone to the other world from coming back and speaking to the living? There are theologians in the church today that are saying that out of body experiences and near death experiences are proof that there is life after death and that people are coming to speak to us. Folks, we need to believe that Jesus is our only source of life and believe in Him and receive Him as our Savior.